I would like simply uh, to, to share with you maybe two points. No? On the one hand, uh, what is the history, if you wish, of this book that we presented uh, a few weeks ago, Hacia un Dialogo entre México y China. This is towards a dialogue between Mexico and China, two and three decades of, of socioeconomic uh, changes. No? The, the title of the book comes uh, from a dialogue. <laughs> Uh, with the Chinese ambassador in Mexico uh, where he where we started like two years ago a first discussion of experiences in Mexico and China who started its reform process around three uh, decades ago and Mexico around two decades ago no so the idea uh, is to go beyond I would say uh, the so-called pendulum law this is that you go from one extreme to the other no? Uh, one extreme would be, as our former uh, president uh, Salinas de Gortari said about the uh, political opposition, we don't see them, we don't hear them, no? so we don't listen to them, we don't see the Chinese. Uh, were simply completely ignorant. And the other uh, extreme, I would say, is to, uh, to follow. Everybody now is very, uh, or hoping somehow, to follow the Chinese economic success. No? So it, it's like from one extreme to the other. Uh, the, the objective and the goal of the book is to have a dialogue, a very concrete dialogue on seven uh, sections from social policies, R&D, uh, trade, productive uh, policies, etc., and to have a dialogue between or with Chinese uh, and uh, Mexican experts on specific topics. No? Uh, the book uh, has 30 chapters, no? so we, we have like nine uh, Chinese uh, uh, authors and colleagues from, from a group of different institutions in China and of course a group of people mainly from, from Mexico but also from Latin America trying to have a dialogue. No, it's not a thing of copy and paste and try to do the same as they did in China and to do it in Mexico. I think in most of the cases this is impossible, but just to uh, have a learning process, hopefully a cumulative learning process between uh, both countries in terms of instruments, in terms of policies, in terms uh, of very concrete uh, mechanisms that have been developed in the last 20 and, th and 30 years in the two countries. No? So this is a little bit, if you wish, the history of the book. No? We have been working for this for, for several years. And I would like to stress that, uh, that the book is also a result of an ongoing research in the last five to seven years uh, at this Center for Chinese-Mexican Studies at UNAM, uh, where uh, whenever you want to do something regarding China, you have to think in the long term. No? So in the last five to seven years, in the first two, three years, we were able to, to publish several books, one uh, with and on the public sector in Latin America and Mexico, what are the what is the analysis and what are the policies uh, regarding China uh, of the public sector? Another publication, what, are the, what is the analysis and, 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 and research uh, and, 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 and policies regarding uh, or from the perspective of the, of the private and business sector? Uh, and in this stage, we're thinking uh, in the next 10 or 15 years. In this stage, we were very happy because we're not only able to publish the book together with the Mexican Senate, but also with the China Institute for International uh, Contemporary Relations, or KIKIR, which is in Pekin, I think, one of the important think tanks regarding uh, international relations and probably together with CAS, that are in CAS has an, uh, an institute for Latin American studies, together with CAS, KIKIR has also a very strong uh, institute on Latin American studies uh, led by uh, Dr. Wu Hongjing, who is also a very good friend. So we have been able to make this joint collaboration. Hopefully in the third or fourth stage, we're able to publish this in China, in whatever language. Maybe in the fourth or fifth or in, a, in another stage, 
were able to publish this uh, in Chinese. And in the last stage, we, we are completely independent. And as our center, we can publish in Chinese in China. But that, again, is in a very, very long run. No? Uh, and as part of this, uh, uh, of this research we are doing, I would very much invite you to look at our web page. You will find we have recently a working paper studies Cuadernos de Trabajo del Sechimex, where we have been working on very detailed commodity chains and segments of commodity chains, copper uh, and the relationship between Chile and China, soya and the relationship between Argentina and China, minerals and the relationship of Brazil and China, electronics and the relationship between Mexico and China, etc., etc. Not to go beyond trade data, beyond broad. Uh, um, I would say broad developments and to focus on very concrete uh, effects of the relationship between Latin America and China in specific regions, firms, etc. <coughs> In addition to this, I would simply like to share with you maybe five important results and, ref and, and uh, reflections uh, of the book. Again, the book speaks of educational policies, high-tech policies, social policies, social issues, trade, production, in specific uh, value-added chains, etc., in most of the cases uh, with specific policy issues. No? Five topics that I would like to share with you. No? First of all, I would like to stress that in general, no? I believe that Latin America uh, and mainly Mexico is widely ignorant of China and we, and we are very ill prepared regarding China. No? In the best of the cases, I would say, like some birds, but also some animals with two legs, <laughs> we would like to, to put our head below the earth and hope that China somehow passes through, hopefully not on us, but on the side of us. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, there is no time for this. No? Uh, and I would say that the ignorance is at many different levels. No? The ignorance, I would say, is at the private sector. This is the business chambers. Uh, there are very few and weak business chambers in Mexico and in Latin America. In some cases in Brazil, I spent several weeks, several years ago, in Sao Paulo and Rio. Uh, they are better than in other cases. But in general, again, business chambers are not well prepared regarding China uh, in terms even of analysis, not to speak of proposals regarding China. No? The same as I would say in the public sector. No? Uh, in the case of, of Mexico, for example, this is very clear. There is not one single direction in the whole state level uh, and federal level public sector that focuses on China, no? not in the uh, foreign ministry, not in the Ministry of Economics or in any other. No? And this despite the idea or the fact that China has become uh, Mexico's second trading partner since 19, uh, since 2003. This is almost eight, nine years. No? Uh, in Mexico, I would say, like in many other countries, and by the way, like in the United States, <laughs> uh, I would say we still believe in the academic, public, and private sector that around 90% of Mexico's trade is being done with uh, the United States. And this is wrong. No? This used to be around 10 years ago and the share from a Mexican perspective, the share of trade from, of Mexico with the United States has fallen dramatically. No? So this is not, a, not only a Mexican and Latin American topic, but a very important, significant U.S. topic that has not been acknowledged sufficiently uh, in the United States. So again, the first topic, I would say there is a wide ignorance on China. A few people that speak Chinese, we're doing very concrete topics for uh, uh, projects, for example, in order uh, that in the next five years, we are able in Mexico to have 30 translators regarding Chinese Mexico and Spanish. No? Today we have one translator. No? <laughs> Luckily she's a good friend of us, but if this translator gets sick or has a bad throat or whatever, the dialogue is kaput. No? <laughs> uh, so I would say again, ignorance and specifically 
the main weakness in, in, in our experience is the institutional, at the institutional level. Institutions are very weak in the academic sector, in the business sector, and in the public sector. The second topic I would like to, to share with you is that beyond numbers, no, uh, uh, as, as Kevin, uh, I mean, many of the, of the articles here in the book also uh, make a lot of different analysis regarding trade, investment, R&D, specific chains in auto parts, automobiles, electronics, etc. But I would like to invite you to the idea that today and in the at least in the la last five to ten years China is today posing a massive qualitative threat to mainly Latin American business and political elites no? with a little bit of irony but with all seriousness I would say that somehow China was the worst student no? and got the best job <laughs> so the question is why? No, of course, as a professor, you would say, well, the other guys didn't learn sufficiently, the textbooks are wrong, or whatever happened. No, but you have other students like Mexico. No, Mexico got the best grade. With Mexico finished its BA very quickly, did its masters, its PhD on time, with a perfect relationship to its professor. But we're doing very bad in terms of GDP growth and other variables. If you take the, the database of the World Development Indicators, for 1980, 2009, this is 30 years, GDP growth per capita in China was 13 times higher than, uh, in China was 13 times higher, times higher than in Mexico. Not 13%, but 13 times higher in three decades. The question is why? You know, for us, it's only always the first picture to say, are we sufficiently open to ask ourselves why or not? Or are we going to continue with stable macroeconomic policies as we have been doing in the last 20 years? And in the next 30 years, we're going to see the same result. The problem is that we have extremely dogmatic uh, public elites in Mexico in the last 20 years mainly made in the Ivy League of the United States. We have a very small group of macro macroeconomists that do fantastically well regarding the textbooks, but very bad regarding results, regarding competitiveness, regarding policies. No? Again, in terms, I would say, of GDP growth, 30 times less than another country, I would expect or hope to have a dialogue and to ask ourselves why. No? Uh, and of course, this challenge goes not only in terms of public policies, long-term policies, I would say bets in R&D, in trade, in regional policies, etc., uh, but also regarding other old <coughs> political economy issues such as property, no? uh, which is really interesting. No? The idea that in most of Latin America, that private property is more efficient, more productive, more whatever, and we have the whole list of adjectives regarding public pro property versus private property, is in the Chinese case not correct. No. I've been working personally in the last two years on the automobile and auto parts chain in China. No. And almost today, almost one out of four cars globally are being produced in China. No? And from the main pro car producers in China, there is practically not one single car producer with private property as we know it in the Western world. No? FAW, Saix, and many other firms are public. This is public, not one single from uh, the central government, but from cities, from provinces, from municipalities even in some cases. No? So again, China is deeply questioning what most of Latin America and mainly Mexico has been doing in the last 20 years. No? Just to have an idea, Mexico was, for example, the only country in the crisis of 2008-2009 that did not begin with counter-cyclical policies. No? Our economy fell in terms of GDP by minus 7.4%. Uh, 
the Chinese central government was very worried about the possible crisis in China because their economy was only growing by 8.7 percent. No? <laughs> so I would say the, uh, the growth rate was more or less similar. The only difference was the, the sign in front of the, the, of the value. No? And as a, re as a result of this preoccupation in China, they did massive counter-cyclical policies. Until today, 2011, 2011, in this small group of macroeconomists in Mexico, there is still no discussion of, of why Mexico might have been doing was the worst case in 2009 in terms of GDP growth. No? So there is still a very strong belief that uh, things it, as they have been doing in the last 20 years are practically the only option. No? The second, uh, or the third, so I, s I spoke about this white ignorance on China and the little preparation on China of this massive quantitative and qualitative main, main challenge of China regarding business and political elites regarding policies in Latin America. The third topic I would like to simply highlight from a Latin, um, Latin American perspective is the impressive technological change in terms of trade and production that m the China has been doing in the last 20 years. No? This change might, n might not be that impressive, maybe from a European or from a US American perspective. But from a Latin, Latin American perspective, tomorrow I will share with you some uh, slides and some, uh, some, some graphs on this. But from a Latin American perspective, it's impressive not only to see the growth of production, as Kevin was showing, and the growth of trade of cho China globally, but the change of the composition of trade and of production. This is in terms of, of products with a medium and high tech uh, level. Uh, in 1995, around one quarter of China's trade, uh, excuse me, not trade, exports, one quarter were of medium and high technology level. In 2009, this grew to 53%. So exports are growing dramatically, but the composition is also changing very substantially. No? Of course, the question there, and this is, I think, the part of a fascinating research is, well, what is behind this? No? The, this is China is not only cheap labor power, but also increasingly uh, more sophisticated uh, technological products of which of course, there is an important part uh, of transnational corporations, but increasingly of products made in China. No? Uh, and in terms, or I would say again from this Latin American perspective, in terms of this technological uh, change in terms of trade and production, uh, of course, the trade relationship with Latin America has been very difficult from a Latin American perspective. In 2008, Latin America did an 80, uh, excuse me, a 50 billion uh, trade deficit with China, and Mexico is probably the, one of the most difficult cases. No? Uh, in 2009, the trade relationship with China, China is Mexico's second main trading partner only after the United States. The imports of China versus exports to China in 2009 were 16 to 1. In 2010, this relationship fell to 11 to 1, but we had a trade deficit of Mexico of almost 41 billion. No? So Mexico today faces, in terms of this qualitative challenge, a massive problem in terms that we ex do not exactly know <laughs> what to export to China. It's very easy to import from China, and I would say the potential of exporting from China to, the United, to, to Mexico, considering this co technological change, is impressive. But the problem for most of Latin America is what to export uh, to China, and in terms of considering this trade deficit. A, first, a fourth point uh, I would like to share with you is the idea that in most of the discussion and the debates between Latin America and, change, and, and China, there is still this, I would say, almost rather old debate initiated by the Inter-American Development Bank 
of the idea that there is a group of winners and losers. No? Uh, the winners in the relationship with China are the countries such as Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and some others increasingly such as Peru and Venezuela that are able to export commodities to uh, China, which are the losers. The losers are countries such as Mexico <coughs> and Central America that do not have these uh, 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 commodities and thus are, are having an important trade deficit. I would argue, and I think this comes out very clearly in the book and other publications that we have been doing, that this is a very simplistic and superficial and primitive view of the relationship between each of the, of the countries with China. Because, of course, a, 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 even strictly a trade relationship does not only depend on exports, but you have to also include in the equation imports. And what China is doing in all the cases, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Chile, which we have been studying in detail, but also in Mexico and in, in, in Central America, is that China is, in a few years, very deeply questioning sectors that developed in the last 30 years as a result of import substituting policies. No? The sectors that Kevin was mentioning, such as electronics, yarn textile garment, automobiles, auto parts, and many others, have been suffering and lo losing very strongly against China. So even countries such as Brazil that have been able to export minerals and, and some other ores have been importing massively uh, products with a higher value added, with a higher technological sophistication, and affecting in terms of employment, jobs, uh, wages, and many other uh, socioeconomic variables. So again, it is insufficient, I would say, to discuss the relationship of Latin America and China in terms of a small group of winning and losing groups, but the, the, the situation is much more complex. And it turns out that, of course, there are, of course, regional policies that make sense, region in terms of Latin America that makes sense uh, regarding China. Th this is one additional policy, an important policy, I would say, in terms of having a common agenda on specific topics in Latin America towards China. Finally, I would simply invite you, yes, I'm, I'm finishing the, first uh, the fifth and last topic, I would simply invite you to, to, to engage, I would say, in, in, uh, in this important and I would say interesting research agenda for the future. No? There are a lot of topics to be discussed, to be analyzed in detail. Uh, in, in most of Latin America and in Mexico, and many of these topics are also uh, proposed, are being proposed in the books. No? The issue of economic development, the analysis of specific value added chains uh, from a Latin American perspective is critical. I would say always that it is not the same to discuss China uh, from a U.S. perspective, from a Vietnamese perspective, from a Berlin perspective, or from a Mexican perspective. No? <laughs> the effects, the impacts, even in terms of R&D, etc., are different. No? So there is a research agenda regarding economic development. Of course, a research agenda regarding environment, ecological, and agricultural topics. Uh, and a very interesting research agenda <coughs> which results also in the book in terms of cooperation potential on specific items and trying to go beyond the, f the famous question if China is a threat or if it is an opportunity. No, our experience at our center is that we want to go far beyond that. Uh, there are some people that go on, is China a threat or is it an opportunity? And then it's a long uh, discussion, but there are very few policy proposals on this. In general, and uh, here we agree very much, I think, with the, with the research uh, results of Carol and also of Kevin, we are very much against any China bashing. 
China is, I would say, in general, like a mirror for Latin America. No? <laughs> it is telling, finally, the king or whoever is naked. No? <laughs> uh, we are very weak in terms of competitiveness. We are very weak in terms of technological development, of value-added policies, etc. Uh, and this has been discussed in detail in the last year. So in China is today, in these terms, simply highlighting the problems of, of Latin America. And I think there is a vast research and policy agenda uh, which is being discussed in the book. No? Thank you very much.